There's a moment when the sun disappears, when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when the night comes out. When the Night Comes Out presents Hellhound, Part 1. World War I was one of the most horrific things ever inflicted upon the world. Much of what has become modern warfare got its start right then and there. But it was also a world where the old monsters collided head-on with the new ones. This is the story of one of the old monsters. The kind of world-eating monsters that lurk in the darkest of corners when the night comes out. The column of soldiers walked through the mud as quietly as any group carrying so much weight could. The sun hung low in the sky, just barely visible through the constant haze of smoke and debris in the air, piercing the man-made clouds like a surgeon's knife made from light. They were tired, past the point of what anyone outside of this never-ending hell of trenches, mud, explosions, and death would understand as tired. They were weary to the core. America had only just joined this world war a few months ago, but her troops had learned hard lessons fast. Lessons about machine guns and barbed wire, about just how many men could die in rapid succession, about gas, bombs, and how humans could somehow adapt even to the worst humanity could conjure. Robert Bobby Edmonds walked at the head of the line. Two nights ago, he had made it across the no-man's land into a German trench. Fighting hand-to-hand, he had stabbed and pummeled his way to a chamber within to find maps with clearly defined enemy troop movements and placements. This had somehow earned him a reward of marching this lean elite team to a small French town no one had ever fucking heard of before. Behind him were 25 men. All of them marched with their heads down. Soldiers learned fast to keep their heads down here. Rain could quickly turn the road into mud so thick you'd be frozen to the spot. Your friends would be unable to do anything to help you lest they get stuck too, so you'd sink until you vanished. The bodies buried beneath the ground, which would eventually dry up from mud, making your body one with the planet. Symbolic, but also terrifying. How much further? Marty asked from Bobby's left. Not much. Look, you can just make out the tops of the buildings. Marty wiped at his eyes and squinted into the distance. That's a town? Not much left of it. This close to the front? What do you think would be left? You got me. I understand nothing about this patrol. What are we doing here? Well, the other day a recon plane flew over this place, said they saw Germans in the town. Like, lots of them. At least 20, maybe as much as 50. Then our raid the other day showed the patrol never came back. But our top guys think something of value might be in here. Why they never came back, no one knows. No bombardment has happened here for weeks. Look, even the trenches here look old and unused. Half of them collapsed. But Intel says the Germans want to send another patrol here. We're supposed to find out what's up. Marty sighed. So, again, I ask, why did they send us? Could be up to 50 Germans in there. Or, if not, there could be something in there which will kill us. Tell me again, why do they want us to be here? Bobby chuckled. We're supposed to watch from outside the town. Observe, see if anyone's in there. Not supposed to engage with the enemy. I don't care what the top brass say. Marty retorted. Those Germans will shoot at us as soon as they see us. You know it. 
Just keep your head down. Look, we're almost there. Bobby turned around and called for the column to come to a halt. He gestured to show quiet, then did hand signals mixed with whispers to indicate they were to crawl into the trees off to the right, then set up an observation post once they had maneuvered around enough to clearly see the town. They didn't actually crawl. Instead, the soldiers got down into a tight crouch and duck-walked into the trees. The trees themselves were something out of a madman's idea of what trees should look like. The fact they were still standing given the churned-up ground and bomb holes all over the area was amazing. There were no leaves, just barren wood. In some cases, the bark had just been stripped off completely. It was like walking into a nest of skeleton hands. Eventually, the town came into view. Marty was right. There wasn't much left of it after being the center of a bombardment or two. Perhaps there had been battles here between the French and the Germans before the U.S. got here. Concentrating hard on what remained of the structures, Bobby could just make out what the place must have looked like before the war. Elegant shops and homes, cobblestone streets, balconies on people's houses and apartments, flower shop, bakery, church. The kind of life people dreamed about when they talked about moving to France. Bucolic was the word which came to Bobby's mind. There still remained a few houses and walls, but the streets had long ago been churned up by military machines, cars, perhaps even tanks. Most of the walls held up nothing, just shells of homes, defying the will of the bombs by some innate sense of duty as to what a wall's job was. What remained were riddled with holes, offering plenty of places where snipers might nest. There were houses with entire walls missing, what remained of them piled in mishmashed debris out in front. There was debris everywhere. Right now, there was no movement at all within the town proper. Well, at least they could see, Bobby thought to himself. They continued for another few minutes, moving deeper under cover as the sun went down. Phil had field glasses, which was rare, but apparently this mission was seen by someone as so important they had found them for the column of men to use. Phil set up a tripod and affixed the binoculars on top. He peered through them for several minutes, making minor adjustments and turning them slowly left to right. The rest of the soldiers sat there in the quiet and growing darkness, almost afraid to breathe. Well? Bobby asked. I can't see a damn thing alive in there but rats. Phil replied. I don't see any Germans, that's for sure. I don't know what's so important about this place. Not for us to wonder. Bobby replied. He turned to face the rest of his men. They stared at him with the whites of their eyes shining through the darkness. They were coated in mud. Mud was such an ever-present thing these days, it was almost considered part of the standard uniform of a soldier. We're going to be here at least for the night, he told them. Get the machine guns set up. One there, and one there. We'll keep watching the town in shifts. Selino, you got the other field glasses? Yes, sir. The rest of you, pack it in for the night and get sleep while you can. We don't know if the Germans are in there, so stay alert. We may have to fight tomorrow. Should we light a fire to cook? What do you think, Rogers? The man shrugged. Just wanted some hot food and not the other stuff. Stop complaining. Now get to work. Make sure your rifles are ready to shoot. Stay low. They did get to work. These men knew what to do. Phil kept his eye to the field glasses while the others dug in, did their best to set up a makeshift camp. As the sun went down, the earth began to shake beneath them. Along the horizon, in the distance, bright flashes lit up the sky like lightning. Late for a bombardment, Marty said, sitting down on a log next to Bobby. Was probably supposed to happen around noon, Bobby retorted. But the top brass had to argue about it for six hours. Marty laughed and took a bite out of a biscuit which looked as hard and tasty as a rock. He crunched on it for a moment, lost in his own mind. It was good to be away from it for a while, he said. Bobby just nodded. 
He remembered the first time he experienced the big guns. It was hard to explain, but it was like God had a thousand fists and was pummeling the earth in a rage as a spoiled child denied his candy might. The entire world seemed about to crack and its fiery guts would spill out beneath you, then flow up your legs, consuming you. Surely these guns and corresponding missiles were so massive they would cause the planet to split in two. All you could do was huddle in a trench. Nowhere was safe, not even the dugouts they made for the higher-ups to make their plans. The earth shifted, then mountains of dirt and debris flew into the air. It all came down on you like pellets from a gun. You held onto your knees and screamed into the noise, but prayed you'd live through it. You prayed you weren't buried alive in a trench in France. On and on it went until you were certain your mind would snap like a twig. You'd end up raving or catatonic, or you'd just run into the hellish sound and be blown to pieces. This was just the first in a series of nightmares you experienced here. The late-night patrols across no man's land were soon added. The run over the top and running into machine gun fire was also constant. Death was always there. Dead men lined the walls of every trench, becoming part of it. You got used to the taste of blood on your lips, your hands, your food. It was always possible it wasn't even your own blood. Marty was right. It was good to be here and away from it. Even if there were Germans in the town, dealing with a few Germans was somehow better than dealing with the entire country, the whole army, across the pitted field between their trenches and the Americans. Bobby and Marty pulled out cigarettes, lighting them carefully in the growing darkness. They both slid down into the mud a bit further. Do you really think the Germans care about this town? Marty asked. Bobby shrugged. I hope not. I hope they just walked through here and we just missed it. The airplane guys don't always get the full picture. I heard some of the guys say the future war will all be fought in the air. Marty said, blowing smoke rings. I can believe it. Bobby said. They'll just keep making them faster and able to fly longer distances or up higher. Hell, they might actually end up in space someday. Marty laughed. I can't even fathom such a thing. What nightmares do you think are up there? Bobby laughed too. God only knows. Maybe nothing. Hey, I think I saw something. Phil said. Bobby froze. He looked over at Marty. It was hard to detect his friend's face in the growing shadows, but he could tell the man's body had stiffened. Shit. Bobby whispered. He crawled his way through the muck. He could feel the eyes of the rest of the men boring into his head. Bobby reached Phil and the binoculars. Phil's eyes were wide in the darkness. What did you see? Bobby asked. Phil shook his head. Bobby heard the fabric of his shirt rubbing against his neck. I don't know. He replied. I saw something move and... It was big, almost like a shadow across the whole set of binoculars. A shadow? You're crazy. You blinked or something. No. Phil replied. It was something. Moving fast. Doesn't sound like the Germans. I didn't say it was the goddamn Germans. I just said I saw something. Bobby didn't want to get into an argument. He rubbed his eyes and peered through the glasses. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust. Then the village came into view. It was difficult to see much, just shadows and darkness. He could make out the piles of debris and the broken buildings. There was no movement. Somewhere, insects droned. Funny, Bobby thought. So much death and destruction, and yet the bugs still kept coming. When the rest of the world was dead and gone, the entire planet would just be insects. Then, something rushed across the lenses. Bobby's head snapped back. Did you see it? Phil asked. I saw something. 
A shadow, right? Bobby nodded. I saw something. I don't know what, though. A goddamn shadow. It moved too fast to be a soldier, though, Bobby said. He put his eyes against the binoculars again. He adjusted the viewfinder. There was nothing but shadows visible. How could he determine one shadow from another? More piles of rubble, bricks, and stone. He could see right into what had once been a parlor or living room in one building. Bobby could almost imagine a family living there, eating there, perhaps, drinking coffee or tea. He waited for several minutes, staring as the darkness grew and the image of the town grew dimmer. Soon, there would be no way to make out anything within. There was no further movement. He ground his teeth and cursed under his breath. He sat back, and when he turned around, stared into the wide eyes of the entire group. All of them were breathing shallowly, if at all, looking at him eagerly. When he didn't respond right away, it was Phil who broke the silence. Well, did you see it? Bobby shook his head, chewing on his lower lip. I saw something, or thought I did. Look, I stared through the fucking thing for several more minutes and nothing happened again. What did you see? Marty asked. I don't know. God damn it, I don't know what I saw. There was a sort of shadow, a quick movement across the lens, but it could have been anything. A bird, a bat, my goddamn imagination. I can't say it was anything remotely like a German. They sat in silence again. What do we do? Phil asked. I don't know. Bobby replied. The orders are to sit here and watch to see if there are German troops. We're not supposed to chase after shadows. But there was something. I don't know if there was or not. Phil, stop scaring the rest of the group. You don't know what you saw any more than I do. He sat back against a fallen tree and cursed under his breath. What was he supposed to do with this? He was sure he had seen something. Exactly what it was, he couldn't be sure but he was absolutely certain it wasn't a German tank, a soldier, or a machine gun. Just then, a hideous howling sound filled the air. The entire group of men jumped and clutched their hands to their ears. It was so loud, it was unlike any howling Bobby had heard before, and he had owned bloodhounds and other dogs all his life. It went on and on, much longer than any normal howl he had heard before. What in the holy fuck? Bobby had no idea who said the question, because the insane howling just kept going. Then there was a pause, followed by another long howl. Bobby had been afraid many times during his tenure on the front. However, the dim fear of dying before charging across the space between the fronts was different, that feeling was a nervousness, which was hard to describe. His training superseded these emotions as he jumped into action. Sitting in a field outside of a dead town, hearing this horrific thing was something different. This spoke to his most primal fears, the ones going back to ancestors who lived in the woods or the wilderness. What is that? It has to be a wolf, Marty said but his voice quavered with uncertainty. There's never been a wolf who made a noise like that. Shut up, Bobby said, and he snapped his eyes back to the field glasses. It was too dark to see much of anything now, just shadows mixed with more shadows. Then, something moved again, and this time he saw a flash of red, two red discs in the distance. The red dots looked a lot like eyes. There was a flash of white beneath the red, a flash of white which quite closely resembled teeth. Bobby staggered backward from the mounted field glasses. The look of terror on his face caused the men to back away, save for Marty, who came to his side immediately. Bobby, what did you see? Bobby looked his friend straight in the eyes. This place is haunted. Haunted or cursed, we need to get out of here. 
Marty cracked Bobby hard across the face. The sting snapped him back to reality. Pull yourself together, man. Marty hissed. The men are watching. Just then, the howl came once more. Much louder, much longer. Most disturbingly, much closer. Chris, what's going on here? A man named Plemons asked. Bobby rubbed his face and got back upright. The howl continued for another few moments. When it ended, the silence was horribly absolute. The bombardment had stopped in the distance also, but the insects had stopped making noise here too. It was strange and eerie, as if the entire world held its breath. It's a wolf, Bobby said. We're just a dog. It spooked me for a minute when I saw its eyes, but it's a dog. Probably a pet from the town which has been on its own for a while. Probably starving. I've been around a lot of dogs, even a wolf or two in my day, and I've never heard one like that. Dixon said, his voice quivering. God damn it, pull yourselves together. I never thought I'd see a bunch of shell-shocked cowards in U.S. uniforms like this. Our orders are to observe the town overnight and report back in the morning. We're going to do it. We'll work in shifts. Two of them. One will man the glasses, the others will be ready with a rifle. If a hungry dog or a rabid wolf comes near, shoot it. The men regarded him silently. He could see he had wounded their pride by calling them cowards. Most of them had volunteered to be here, and some had considered going to other countries in order to join in the fight against the Kaiser while America dragged its feet entering the war. The rest of you eat something and quit letting shadows turn into ghouls. I'm not your mommy, and there's not monsters under the bed. If you can manage it, get some rest. We'll be back at the front tomorrow. Use this time to rest. There are enough things to fear back at the front. The men grumbled, but they got back to their positions. There was an aura of fear, and as the darkness grew, so did the aura. Bobby sat back inside, removing his helmet and running his fingers through his greasy, sweaty hair. When was the last time he had washed it? His entire body felt comprised of dirt. What did you see? Marty asked. Phil was there too, listening eagerly, leaning in. I don't know. A shadow? Something? I thought I saw two glowing red dots. They looked like eyes. Then a flash of white. It's all in my head. I'm going cuckoo here. Phil did not look assured. He gazed back at the mounted field glasses as if they were a snake about to bite him. Phil, I need you to keep an eye out, Bobby said. I know you're a bit shaken, but I need your eyes. I need you to take the first shift. Can you handle it? Phil did not look like he could handle it in the least. The man was practically shaking in his place, but he nodded. Thanks, Bobby said. We'll make sure nothing gets in. Anything you see, though, you let me know. Just try not to shout again. Let's not let our imaginations turn everything into a ghost or goblin. Phil reluctantly moved back to the field glasses. Bobby had no idea what he was going to be able to see at this point. The sun was gone, and the night out here was absolute. Bobby was from New York, and he wasn't used to the total darkness when the sun went down you found out in this godforsaken part of the world. Nothing could prepare him for the sheer number of stars. He gazed up at them now, but they offered no solutions. The moon was out there, but apparently not visible yet. Just black in the sky, merging with the blackness along the horizon. What are we going to do? Marty asked. What do you mean? You're cracking up, and the darkness here is just going to continue to spook these guys. You mean to tell me you don't realize they'll shoot at an owl at this point? Marty had a point, but Bobby didn't want to take their rifles away. In the darkness, attempting to walk back was suicide. They could wander into German territory if they weren't careful, 
or end up tangled in barbed wire or drowning in mud. There's nothing we can do about it, Bobby said. I hope the guys just keep their heads the best they can. We can't head back now, unless you can see in the dark. I wish. Marty replied. Then he settled back against the log. Marty was from the south, Alabama. He was used to being out in fields in the middle of the night, looking up at the stars. This was nothing new to him. However, he wasn't a cat, and there were far more dangers in these fields than perhaps bumping into a scarecrow. Think you'll get any sleep? Marty asked. I didn't think I'd get any sleep even before we started jumping at shadows and hearing howls in the night. They were quiet. There were still no more sounds of insects, no sounds of anything. Even the other men were quiet, perhaps muttering to each other. Bobby put his head back against the log. He was bone-tired. What had he seen in the glasses? Surely it had been imagination. Phil had suggested he had seen something. Bobby had that in his head when he looked— He'd seen shadows and then amplified his own fears with red eyes and white teeth. Sure, it almost made sense if you thought about it in such a way. Except it was convoluted and didn't entirely hold up to scrutiny. What did such thought leave him? The reality of a shadowy monster with teeth? In France? During a war? Bobby had been happy to work in construction back home. In New York, things made sense to him. There was violence and there was dirt, but there wasn't gas or tanks or machine guns. There were no monsters. Not like this one. When the rumors of the Kaiser had started to leak, he and his friends knew this was their chance for glory. Glory and war. They were bombing children, raping women, ransacking towns. The Germans wanted to take over the world with their mustard gas and zeppelins, while their bombs dropped on big cities and their dreadnought battleships threatened the security of the planet. The Germans themselves were little more than machines dressed as men. Bobby had several friends who went to Canada to join the army or fly planes. The U.S. dragged its feet about entering the war, and Bobby worried his country was a coward, or at least run by them. Then, the Germans sent their submarines into supposedly neutral waters to blow up ships. Things changed fast afterwards. Now, here he was. In France. In the war. It didn't take long for him to realize the Germans, at least the soldiers, were just people. They weren't the Kaiser. They were kids who bled and died just like the Americans. The first day the Americans had gone over the top of the trench and ran toward the German lines, the sound of the machine guns had become the entire world. The soldier in front of him had just blown apart when the bullets shredded him. Bobby ran through a mist of blood, the mud squelching beneath his boots. Here he was, seeing the world, and it turned out the rest of the world had turned to shit. Hey. Hey, Bobby. Bobby's eyes snapped open. It surprised him to see he had fallen asleep. He looked at his watch, pulling it close to his face. Three in the morning. What? Who? It was Johnson, one of the men, one of the youngest in the group. His eyes were wide and white in the darkness, fear across his face. Bobby looked to the right and saw Marty dozed fitfully next to him. Most of the men rested. What? He asked. I was at the glasses. I, I think I saw something. Bobby wiped at his eyes. Are you sure? The words out of his mouth were like a reflex. Just one look into the kid's eyes and he knew there was no doubt. Okay, okay. Bobby said, his head fuzzy and cloudy. How had he fallen so soundly asleep? Any idea what you saw? Movement, the kid replied. But it's so dark, nothing was clear. It's so quiet, though. I didn't hear footsteps or anything. 
Fabi listened for a moment. Absolute silence. He had spent so much time at the front, huddled in a trench. Even when they were huddled against the mud walls of a trench, sounds were everywhere. Humans made so much noise even when it was supposed to be quiet. Sometimes it got so quiet you could hear someone in the German trench cough. Then there would be a gunshot at someone who peered over the edge. There was never total darkness either. Lamps burned up and down the trenches or within the bunkers. Out here, right now, there was nothing. Not an owl hooting, not the sounds of the men breathing. No movement and no light. The darkness was so profound it made Bobby wonder if they were still on planet Earth anymore. Had they been flung into space? Perhaps sucked into some other dimension of silence? Was there even a war on where they were now? Bobby shifted and waddled his way over to the field glasses. The kid did the same. Where was the soldier who was supposed to be guarding the perimeter? Who's on guard? Bobby asked. Stevens. Any idea where he is? The kid shrugged. Bobby pressed his eyes to the glasses. Just barely the hint of shadows out there visible through the lenses. How any movement could be detected, he had no clue. What he wouldn't give for the ability to send up a flare so it would bathe the entire area in light. I don't see... Just then, there was movement for certain. It was so fast, so brutal. Bobby stared at the spot where it was for what felt like minutes in utter disbelief. One moment, the kid was there, next to him, staring at the side of his head. Then there was the hint of a shadow, a rush from Bobby's left, a moving shadow. There was a soft puff of wind as if something moved past quick. In the instant this happened, there was the sensation of something hot and wet across Bobby's face. It was so fast, it took him several seconds to realize the kid's head was gone. The kid's body didn't seem to register what had happened either. It sat there, hands and legs in the same position they had been a moment earlier. The bloody stump of a neck sprayed blood into the air, then pulsed with a steady beat and stream with the diminishing heartbeats. As if someone had cut the strings, the body just slumped over to the side. Before it hit the ground, the shadow moved again, just as fast, this time from the right. Now, the entire body burst apart as if hit by an explosive device. More blood flew into Bobby's face and into his mouth. The intestines burst forth and landed in Bobby's lap. They were warm, steaming in the cool night air, wet against his legs. His paralysis broke and he screamed, a scream from deep within him, the depths of his soul. The other men were awake in an instant, and soon their own screams joined his. As the horror of what had happened in front of his face sank in, the horror of what caused it took focus. Bobby felt hot breath on his face, coming from above him. He smelled blood on the breath, the stench of old, rotten meat. Blood dripped onto his head. The animal towered over him, over everything, Bobby was sure if he dared look up, his head would just crane back and back until he fell over backwards and still he would not see the top of this creature. He saw bristled black fur, saw massive dark paws deep in the mud, tipped in sharp, ragged claws. Bobby did not yet look up. The world fell away. As the fight-or-flight reflex kicked in and his body flooded his bloodstream with adrenaline, Bobby got to his feet and ran. There was no war. There were no Germans. He did not see the soldiers around him. There was just pure primal terror and the desire, the desperate need to flee. The creature was behind him, so he ran towards the bombed-out village, which was a mass of darkness and shadow ahead of him. Anything could be within the ground between here and there. A landmine relatively new to this war and something only rumored to exist, might blow him to bits. He did not care. 
his arms out in front of him in a vain attempt to ward off either gunfire from Germans within the town or collision with something devastating, Bobby ran. His boots barely touched the mud as he moved with a speed he had never achieved before. Behind him, the screams came. There was a horrifying growling sound, and then the kind of scream a man made only when pain and horror ripped him to pieces. High-pitched, swimming with blood, and then cut off as if via a thrown switch. One by one. At first, the hurried babble of the men reached his ears in such waves they threatened to overwhelm him as they tried to figure out what was happening. Then the beast tore into them. He heard their bones snap and the ripping, tearing sounds like wet rags as their flesh was rent asunder. Bobby stumbled when his right foot trod upon a stone awkwardly. He nearly fell, his pinwheeling arms kept him upright, and he propelled himself forward. He heard footsteps behind him. Someone dashed past him on the left. He caught no more than the basic shape of a man and it was gone. Someone else came up fast on the right. Another came up to the right, and this time Bobby caught a face. A look of wide-eyed terror, then a haze of blood immediately after some quick shadowy movement Bobby's senses barely registered. The creature was right behind him. Still, he saw men moving all around in the darkness. He heard a gunfire and then more screaming. His face was slicked in blood and he tasted it on his lips. A steady mist hung in the air, but there were no clouds overhead. The storms from a cold front would not come for another day or so. Then, as he closed his eyes to prepare for the sharp clawed blow which would finish him, he stumbled again and fell face first to the ground. His helmet tumbled off and rolled into darkness. Bobby put out his hands and felt hard, jagged rocks scrape his palms, then open wounds on his nose and cheek. He was within the limits of the town. The breath in his lungs felt full of glass, and he turned back to see from where he had just come. How could he cover the distance so quickly? His head buzzed. The shadows of the night behind him moved. Some of them were his men running, but mostly it was the quick, barely detectable movement of whatever creature tore them apart. He saw the red eyes again. He saw the white teeth flash. One by one, the screams began, and then there was sudden silence. More of the men reached the limits of the village. Bobby couldn't tell who was there, but he heard them fall to the ground all around him. Then he heard the frantic panting of terrified men who had just run across a field chased by a creature tearing them to pieces. Just as Bobby was about to open his mouth to ask who was with him and if everyone was all right, the howl began again. <laughs> This time, however, it was louder than ever. Reflexively, Bobby put his hands to his ears. Despite this, he could still not blot out the sound. It filled his chest and was something he felt in his bones all the way back to his spine. When the first howl stopped, a second started up again. On and on this went for what felt like an eternity. Just when Bobby was sure his head would split open from the sound... It stopped as quickly as it started. There was just the heavy, terrified breathing of the soldiers around him. Who's here? He asked. Hey, anyone there? Um, I'm here. Marty's voice filtered through the breathing. Jesus Christ, what was that thing? Other voices echoed next. Bobby counted nine, maybe ten distinct replies. Then, silence. Is that everyone? He asked. Ten? No other voices spoke. What was that thing? Marty repeated. It moved so fast. Was, was it some kind of bear? No bear moves so fucking fast. Said another voice Bobby could not immediately identify. I think it was a wolf. Wolves don't move that fucking fast either said another man. If it's a wolf, it's bigger than any which ever existed. I saw it rip Davis apart. It moved so fast it was a blur and it had to be ten feet tall. 
Impossible, Bobby said. No wolf is so big. I'm just telling you what I saw. Red eyes, huge teeth. The fucking teeth had to be a foot long. It ripped him apart, took off his head, and then shredded the rest of him. Poor fucker never stood a chance. What are we going to do, Bobby? Marty asked, the terror in his voice as real and noticeable as the howling which had just ended. Are we in the town? Are we in the fucking town which may hold fucking Germans? Bobby looked around. So dark, but his eyes had adjusted a bit. A blown-out building to his left and a pile of rubble. To his right, another building, barely standing, the walls knocked down and scattered in the street. Bricks and stones scattered all around them. Yes, we are, Bobby said. Now another fear crept into his gut. Fear of the enemy they had been sent across an ocean to kill. If there were Germans present, they would have heard the screams. They'd have heard the gunfire. If they were even half as good as the American soldiers, they'd be on their way here even in the darkness. We need to get undercover, Bobby said. He indicated the house off to his right, the one which at least seemed mostly intact. Get in there. Jesus, what about that thing out there? Bobby couldn't tell who had spoken. You saw how fast it moved. We've been sitting here for a few minutes, and it hasn't come to finish us off yet. For some reason, it doesn't want to come into the town. So, let's get hidden before the Germans come do its job instead. They got to their feet. One of the men moaned as he started to walk. Others cursed under their breath, but the fear was palpable. There was no further protest. There wasn't much left of the building. It appeared to have been a house at one time. A few of the interior rooms were relatively undamaged. Two of the exterior walls were down, and a giant hole awaited them along a third wall. Not much cover, but darkness was the real shelter right now. Get down as far as you can, Bobby said. There's almost no protection here. Stay low, be quiet. Marty was at his side a moment later with a cigarette. Bobby inhaled deeply as they found a spot in what looked like it used to be the kitchen. It was then he noticed his hands were covered in blood. Christ, I got that kid's blood all over me, he said. Did you see it? Not much, just quick movements. Think I saw teeth, maybe those red eyes again. You? I sure as shit did, Marty whispered. It had to have been seven, eight feet tall, Bobby. All black, coarse fur, huge teeth, and yeah, red eyes. Bobby inhaled smoke and thought about this. What the fuck is it, do you think? Marty blew smoke looked like a dog or a wolf, but ain't no wolf ever looked like that. I think we're dealing with something out of the norm. Supernatural. Ugh, don't give me that shit. Don't dismiss it. There's more to this world than meets the eye. Truthfully, I don't know how it exists, but it may have something to do with this town. I don't know the answers. Well, scratch that. I know two things. Bobby waited, but when no answer was forthcoming, he asked, What? We know what the fuck probably happened to the Germans if they came here, for one. The other? We are well and truly fucked, sir. If it's a supernatural thing, we are well and truly fucked. With this said, Marty crushed his cigarette and leaned back against the broken kitchen cabinet. He closed his eyes, and Bobby was left alone in the darkness, with his thoughts, fears, and memories. Bobby sat awake most of the rest of the night. There were no more howls. There was no sound of anything moving around outside. It was so strange and quiet compared to the noise of before, it made him wonder if all of this was just a bad dream. He was really asleep in the trench, huddled near the muddy wall and piles of sandbags. At some point he dozed off, but into fitful dreams, and the slightest breeze caused him to open his eyes. It was the fight-or-flight come down. The adrenaline had worn off for now, and he was crashing, but he couldn't let his guard down. 
as the first rays of sun cascaded through the house, piercing their eyes like lasers, Bobby opened his eyes and found himself staring out of a hole in the wall into a pale, white, dirty face attached to a head beneath a German helmet. The image was so surreal it took several seconds for any reaction to kick in. When it did, the adrenaline he had been missing all night flooded back. Hey, hey, stop! Bobby yelled, realizing as he said it something had already stopped the soldier. The soldier's clothing was also a mess. He held a rifle loosely at his side. The eyes set within the skull were wide and staring, but did not seem to comprehend what they were seeing. His coat appeared much too large for him. The German soldier just stood there, staring, not raising the rifle. Drop the rifle! Bobby yelled. The other soldiers stirred around them, all moving sluggishly. Drop the rifle now! Bobby grabbed his own gun, surprised to see he had grabbed it when he started running the night before. He raised it, pointing it right into the dirty face at the hole in the wall. The German did not seem phased in the least. Instead, he sort of swayed in the breeze, the eyes staring at him, but not really seeing him. Drop the rifle! Bobby yelled again. A friend of his, during basic training and with a knowledge of German, had tried to teach him some phrases. Bobby did pretty well with it too, and the lessons continued as they left training to be shipped across the ocean. Height! Lost Oscar wir fallen! Bobby yelled. The sudden shouting of his native language snapped the German soldier out of his stupor. He made a move which looked like he was raising his rifle, and Bobby pulled the trigger on his own. The shot went wide and pinged off the helmet. The German soldier staggered back but did not go down. The German shouted back in a rush. It took Bobby a minute to translate. The soldier told him they, the Americans, needed to leave the village, not to shoot, something about Hades or hell. The space outside the house was suddenly alive with movement. More German soldiers appeared on the streets. Bobby heard their feet as they moved and saw them out of the corner of his eye. The rest of his team was on their feet now, shouting, telling them to put down their rifles, to surrender. Bobby stood up, trying to reach his full height to look as intimidating as possible. The German soldier he had just fired at did not raise his rifle to retaliate. He just stood there with his wide eyes and a blank stare. Can we all just calm down for a moment? The voice was accented, but calm. There was even a hint of humor in the tone. Bobby didn't want to move his rifle from the soldier in front of him, but he cast his eye to the side. One of the other German soldiers had stepped into the street. He'd raised his hands, a dirty white handkerchief held in the right. He was tall, lanky. His helmet fit poorly on his head, tilted to the left side almost roguishly. He wore a pencil-thin mustache across his upper lip, and there was a hint of a smile secured on his face. Who are you? Bobby demanded. My name is Joseph Hanschecht. I guess you say I'm the highest-ranking soldier here. Well, on the side of the front. Bobby finally turned his head to look at this man. How long have you been here? Bobby asked. No name in return. Quite rude. Sergeant Robert Edmonds. Bobby. I guess I'm in charge of these guys. What's left of them? Joseph smiled. Yes, we heard the commotion last night. You met the wolf, then. Also known as the Hound. Sergeant, we need to shoot these guys. Plemons said from off to the right. They're Huns. We can't trust them. Relax, Plemons. They came upon us asleep. Don't you think if they had any intent, they would have shot us then? Bobby lowered his rifle. He nodded to the wide-eyed pale soldier in front of him. The German nodded back, but his face remained impassive, shocked. We came here to find you, Bobby said to the German. Then he motioned to his own men. Guys, guns down. Is that a smart move, Bobby? Marty whispered. 
Marty, if one of them tries anything, you guys will be able to blast them all to hell a second later. Look at them. Do they look like a fighting force? The Germans totaled six men. All of them looked filthy and exhausted. They had streaks of dirt across or down their faces. Their clothes were torn, almost just shredded rags. One of them was on a makeshift crutch, his right leg bent at the knee. Another had his head bandaged. When Bobby inspected them more closely, he saw all of them were injured in one way or another. They looked thin, too. If there could be a photo to represent exhaustion, this would be it. Yes, we mean you no harm. I think when you hear our story, you realize just how grave the situation is here. We're no longer fighting a war started by our respective governments. We're fighting to stay alive. We'll leave you now, but just for a little while. For a moment, the war and the profound evil it has wrought will be frozen in time. Tune in next time to find out what happens when the night comes out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Ali James. Music by Kevin MacLeod and Vivek Abishek. For Brian's work, visit his website at brianwalaspa.com or visit amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Ali's work on Facebook at Ali James Projects. Visit our website at whenthenightcomesout.com to learn how to support us on Patreon.